Well, let me tell you a little bit about the thought of Hans Urs von Balthasar, which is uh, complex. And he's a difficult person to approach because his, his uh, works are voluminous and they are um, complicated. But let me just give you a couple of handles, maybe. The first one is to look at the three transcendentals. This is a classical idea that wherever you find being, you find the true, the good, and the beautiful. Now, in the modern tradition, it was Immanuel Kant who looked at them precisely in that order. He writes the critique of pure reason, which is on the true, the critique of practical reason on the good, and the critique of judgment, which is on the beautiful. Balthazar consciously reverses the Kantian uh, triptych. He begins with the beautiful. I think what he sensed was, in our modern, now postmodern world, it's a much more winsome approach. You start with the true or the good, people tend to, to block you and they'll say, well, who are you to tell me what's, what's right and what's true? But you begin with the beautiful, there's something that's less threatening about it. And I think he intuited that and he noticed that a lot of theologians in the great tradition, Augustine, uh, Origen, uh, Bonaventure, Newman, many others, John of the Cross, also began uh, with the beautiful. Another observation about this, it was also a kind of um, uh, repudiation of Luther. Luther had said that we can't have a theologia gloriae, a theology of glory, but only a theologia crucis, theology of the cross. And Luther was very suspicious of using the beautiful as a category. Well, Balthazar said, watch me. And so to Kant, he reversed the uh, order of the transcendentals. And then to Luther, he said, no, I'm going to give you a theology of the beautiful. Now, this is really important. We tend to think of the beautiful as a very subjective category. You know, so in the eye of the beholder, you think beautiful, I think it's beautiful. Balthazar is inheriting a very ancient tradition that says, no, no, the beautiful is just as objective as the true and the good. He borrows from Aquinas here. Thomas says that the beautiful occurs at the intersection of three things, what he calls integritas, or wholeness, consonancia, or harmony, and claritas, or radiance. When those three things come together, you have the beautiful. So Balthazar takes that as, as fundamental as well. And what he says is, when the objectively beautiful strikes you, it stops you. So we talk about aesthetic arrest. You know, you're moving along and then you, something beautiful so strikes you that you're stopped in your tracks. And then it claims you and sends you. Now, that can sound very strange, but think of when you see a beautiful movie a movie you love. Well, it stops you in your tracks, and then it sends you as a kind of missionary. I, I got to tell everybody about this movie. This movie is great. You got to see this movie. Or you meet somebody who's wonderful, beautiful, and you're stopped in your tracks, and then you're sent as a disciple, as an apostle. So he takes that as elemental now in the beautiful. Now, here's the thing. Christ is the prime example of the beautiful. Now, why? Well, think of integritas, wholeness. Christ is one. His life is about one thing. I've come to do the will of my Father. There's an integrity to his life. More to it, consonancia, harmony. Of what? Of divinity and humanity. In him, the divine and the human meet, and they are in a harmonious, consonant relationship. Finally, claritas, which means the the shine, the appearance, the radiance. Well, both humanity and divinity are radiant in him. That's why Pontius Pilate is always the unintentional uh, evangelist, the evangelist despite himself. He says, looking at Jesus, ecce homo, look at the man. And so Balthar loved that because he's, it's not like, well, just look at that guy. It's ecce homo, look at humanity. And then St. Thomas, after he sees the risen Christ, can say, my Lord and my God. So in Him, divinity and humanity, in their consonant relationship, become radiant. Integritas, consonancia, claritas, the beautiful, par excellence, is Christ. What does Christ do if we let Him? He arrests us. He stops us in our tracks. Think here of someone doing Eucharistic adoration, someone at Mass, someone who hears the Word of God, someone who even hears vaguely about Jesus. When that Word that presence is clear, it stops you. But it doesn't just do that. It names you, it claims you, and it sends you. Just as Jesus, 2,000 years ago, stopped his apostles in their tracks, named them, in some cases renamed them, and then sent them, the same thing happens today. 
This is why as well he talks about a kneeling theology. Much of theology he um, uh, complained was a sittende theologie. It's a sitting theology, meaning I sit at my desk, my scholar's desk, and I read my books. He felt that has a very limited range. What you need is a kneeling theology, where you are in a worshipful attitude in the presence of Christ, who will name you, claim you, send you. Okay. Now, this gives the transition now to the next part of the trilogy, which is called the Theodramatique. So I talk about the integrity and the consonance of Christ. But see, it's not a static thing. It's a very dynamic interpersonal consonance. Because in him, two freedoms meet. A divine freedom and a human freedom. And the, the drama of the New Testament is the play between these two freedoms. So when Jesus can say, I only do what my Heavenly Father is doing, when he says in Gethsemane, even though he's balking at the cross, but not my will but yours, what we're seeing is the beautiful consonant play between two freedoms. And now this becomes the key then to Balthazar's Christology and his anthropology. Jesus, by his consonant display of divine and human freedom, opens up a new acting area, he calls it, into which we can enter. So, see, modernity is predicated upon autonomy. My freedom, I do what I want, the, the sovereign self. Paul says, no, no, but that's, that's just a, that's a puny distortion of real freedom. Real freedom comes from a surrender to a divine freedom, which names me, claims me, sends me, right? So, as a Christian, I enter into the acting area of Jesus. And that's the whole drama now of my spiritual life. That's the Ignatian exercises. I've got to decide which direction is my freedom going to take. So that's the heart of the theodramatique. One of the key ideas there, which I've always loved, is that I don't know who I am until I found my mission. That's a very biblical idea, isn't it? That I don't know my identity until I've received my mission from God and have done it. That's why Abram becomes Abraham, you know. That's why um, Jacob becomes Israel, why Saul becomes Paul, why Simon becomes Peter. Because when they find their mission, they find their identity. When you find your role in the theodrama, right, then you know who you are. That's Balthazar's Christology and his anthropology. Now, just one more stop on this little very rapid survey of his, of his complicated writing. He wrote a great book in the 60s called Mysterium Pascale, the Paschal Mystery. And it's on the, uh, the three days of Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, leading up to Easter. Um, we find here, first of all, a resolution of the Thomist Scotist problem. It's a technical term now in theology. Thomas Aquinas said that God became human to save us from our sins. If, if we had not sinned, you know, by implication, we wouldn't have the incarnation that he came for a particular purpose to save us from sin. Duns Scotus and theologians in his school say, no, no, even without sin, he would have come to manifest the divine glory. Okay. So it's a famous debate. In, it's kind of a speculative, theoretical debate in theology. Balthazar said, it's a false problem. It's a false problem. Because the glory of God, the Scotus thing, is revealed precisely in the measure that he solves the problem of our sin. So the, the Thomas Scotus problem is a false problem. The book is his illustration of how he solves it. And here's how. God's glory is revealed in the acrobatic act of love by which the Father sends the Son all the way down into God forsakenness so as to bring the world back to the divine life. It's in this self-emptying of the Trinity that we find the glory of God displayed. Now, what's he talking about? The Incarnation has a downward trajectory. So the Son of God becomes human. Paul says, you know, he takes the form of a slave, being born in the likeness of men. He was known to be of human estate, and it was thus that he humbled himself. But then the next step, obediently accepting even death, death on a cross. So what's that? The Son of God going into humanity, but then going all the way down, accepting even death, death on a cross, the worst way to die. Now, so what's the purpose, as Balthar reads it? The Incarnation moves down, 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 so as to go all the way to the limits of God-forsakenness. And that's how he traces the three days, from the 
Last Supper, the washing of the feet of the disciples, the Garden of Gethsemane, the handing over to the temple guards, the Sanhedrin, the trial before Pilate, the crucifixion, his death on the cross, and then his burial. It's the downward journey of the Son of God. The purpose of this is to grab even the last and least of sinners who have wandered as far from God as they can. As the sun goes around even them, as they run away from the Father, they run into the arms of the Son. That's the theory. So here's the stretch of the Incarnation. In the resurrection, Jesus, having grabbed everybody, now in the Spirit, brings them back to the Father. And that's why the, the cross of Jesus is the redemption of all. It's the redemption of the world. Now, I'm not going to go into detail. Look at my other videos for this. But this is where this controversial idea comes from of the hope. The hope that all people might be saved. Does Balthazar know it? No. He repudiates origins of pakatastas. He doesn't claim to know. That's against the church's teaching. However, he says, given, given, the acrobatic act of love manifested in the uh, cross of Jesus. We may hope that all people will be gathered into the divine life. It comes not just from being optimistic or having positive feelings. It comes from this objective fact of, um, of the cross. That's why when he speaks of a reasonable hope that all will be saved, that's what he means. He doesn't mean Oh, I just, wouldn't it be great if all people would be saved? He means there's an objective ground for the hope, namely in this great acrobatic act of love. Um, so that's a very <laughs> quick overview of some of the major motifs in Balthazar. I hope you sense just from that little survey what a rich and complex and, uh, and uh, moving theological thinker he is. And it might prompt you to go back and look at some of these great works.